I believe that these these this combination of of, of stressors is causing a depletion of thiamine at the cell level because thiamine is necessary for adaptation to stress. Vitamin B1 or thiamine might be a commonly overlooked deficiency. And I'm very thankful to Elliot Overton, who came on the podcast today, who's essentially dedicated his life to research and raising awareness on how this vitamin might be at the root of autonomic nervous system dysregulation. So we're thinking things like POTS, anxiety, depression, and through the ANS affecting the vagus nerve and therefore motility, a number of gastrointestinal conditions. And permeating beyond that, local brain metabolism of vitamin B1, when deficient, can lead to things like chronic fatigue, and brain fog. There's a lot of overlap with these symptoms and other conditions that we've discussed in the past, such as SIBO, fungal overgrowth, vector-borne infections such as Lyme. But this might be a missing piece for some people who have these other issues, and we could also add, I suppose, mold to this list, who've treated them without full response. It might be there's a concomitant deficient in thiamine, vitamin B1. Until this is addressed, someone may not see full symptomatic resolution. Uh, resolution excuse me. So we discuss what thiamine or vitamin B1 is, how it functions in the body, and one of the main ways outside of mitochondrial function is also through helping with creation of acetylcholine, one of your chief neurotransmitters, which will affect brain function, autonomic nervous system function, vagal function, gastrointestinal function. Why deficiencies are so common and why so many factors like stress, alcohol, caffeine, inflammation, and infection can deplete thiamine. How testing for this is notoriously inaccurate, surprise, surprise. And then what the protocols are you can use to start repleting a thiamine deficiency, of which there are three main forms of thiamine. Different people may benefit from different forms, different durations, and different dosages. It's not terribly complicated, but there is some nuance here that in the many years of Elliot just obsessing over this, he's codified a few different protocols for people to use. Again, a big thank you to Elliot. I do think this is something that's exciting and very interesting. Again, from the perspective of, for people who haven't fully responded to other therapeutics, this is a recurring theme, how do we help make sure that no one or the smallest group possible is only partially responsive to SIBO treatment, to candida treatment, to Lyme treatment, to mold treatment, whatever it may be. This is one more tool that I think deserves a place in the toolkit. And so with that, we will go to the conversation with Elliot now. Elliot, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I want to thank you because I came across your work on thiamine deficiency, and it took me from having this thiamine protocol maybe like two years ago that we knew it might help people with post-exertional malaise, but it was one of those protocols, and I think all clinicians know what I'm talking about, that's kind of in the back of your mind. You're not sure when to use it. You're not sure who it's going to respond you know, with. Then I came across some of your videos on thiamine, and actually it was really serendipitous. I, I kind of binged on some of your podcasts for about a week. The following week, three patients back-to-back -back who had all been put on a thiamine protocol had a follow-up with me in the same day, and all of them reported it was clearly helpful. So it was kind mm. of one of those serendipitous moments where I said, okay, there's something here. You really helped broaden my awareness. Uh, so that's why I'm really excited to kind of drill down more into thiamine deficiency, which you've dedicated your life to. Um, so just starting with a, a thank you for the work that you're doing, looking into this nutrient deficiency vitamin B1 that seems to be really overlooked. I, I agree. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you managed to to find it and, and, and your patients have started seeing benefits. It never fails to amaze me, the amount of people that can respond, even when they don't have the classical kinds of signs and symptoms that you would be taught in a, you know, whatever training program you've gone through. So, yeah. Sure. And that's one of the challenges I think is if we're looking at 
specifically vitamin deficiencies, and we're only going to look at kind of a conventional medical textbook presentation of severe deficiency, we're going to miss a lot of cases because a lot of people aren't going to necessarily get that bad. But they might have debilitating symptoms of brain fog, fatigue, dysmotility, dysautonomia that just haven't gotten so bad that they go to the hospital and check that box, so to speak. Yeah, and that's that's what makes this kind of so complicated, I think, especially for practitioners, because there's this underlying assumption, uh, and really I think it applies to all nutrients, but especially B1, um, that you have to present with certain diagnostic criteria, let's say, uh, for you to go and get a diagnosis and treat it at a hospital or in some kind of a conventional med- medical setting you would have to tick certain boxes, certain symptoms, certain risk factors, let's say. And the, the truth is, and I think this is, is filtering its way into the medical literature, is that nutritional sufficiency really operates on a continuum. You know, you, you are never necessarily sufficient or insufficient. You're constantly moving back and forth depending on your demands, your physiological demands, your in, in, intake, your dietary intake, your exercise status, your disease status. And we know that inflammation and different kinds of chronic inflammatory conditions, oxidative stress, increase the demand for nutrients. Nutrients are basically how your body adapts to stress. And so you can really burn through nutrients very quickly if you're in a state of physiological stress. Um, And when it comes to nutritional status, uh, if if you don't fit that diagnostic criteria, if you go for a blood test and you see that your blood levels are normal, then a conventional doctor and even many of the alternative doctors might completely rule that out without digging a little bit deeper um, into how the body processes and utilizes nutrients. And it would seem as though there's many more people who would be responsive to nutritional therapies or orthomolecular medicine, but they're just missed from a conventional standpoint. And oftentimes, even with functional testing, uh, these kinds of tests miss people who might potentially respond. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. This really does help us reach more people who are trying to improve their health. So it, it is uh, quite deeply appreciated. And, you know, to sort of support what you're saying, we've been over the past year working on this side project of how do we best assess, not necessarily test, but assess micronutrient deficiencies. And one of the things that we've seen pretty clearly, even though we're not done with this review yet, is that not all vitamins and specifically B vitamins are gonna quantify via a serum or some other sort of blood draw. Some of them are much more accurately diagnosed via history, Mm -hmm. symptoms, and presentation. And that seems to be the case with thiamine, meaning if you did a blood test for thiamine, it's notoriously inaccurate in terms of someone could be very deficient, respond very well to therapy, but their blood test doesn't suggest that's the case. Oh, it's so true. It's so true. And there, there's so many cases that have been missed. And really in the early days when I started digging into this, uh, I was very set on using functional tests or serum tests or blood tests or whatever. So, you know, when I first stumbled across uh, the idea that you could be using thiamine in clinical practice is I'd, I'd been through some of the functional medicine training programs. I'd not come across thiamine at all. In my nutrition schools, I basically learned that, well, okay, if someone is alcoholic or they have these very specific risk factors, then you might they might become deficient in B1. But other than that, there's, there's really uh, not much information on it at all. So I stumbled across this, this information five, six years ago, six years ago. And, um, and, and I was very set on using functional tests at the time. So I was using like organic acids testing and some of the functional B vitamin testing. So they measure different enzymes inside cells in red blood cells, and they can determine, a, 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 they say that they're able to determine if someone's deficient or not. And, um, and I would find several people who I would run these tests on, get them to spend $400 or something like that. And it would come back that they weren't deficient And then they, you know, whatever would happen, I would stop consulting with them. And then maybe six months, a year down the line, they might get in contact with me again and say, hey, hey, Elliot, I saw your videos or read your article on on uh, on high dose thiamine and I tried it and it actually resolved X, Y, Z symptom. So I saw this time and time again where we would do these so-called specialized tests and yet it wouldn't show that they were deficient and yet they would use it anyway and they would see major improvements. So I gradually, my faith gradually started to decline in these tests. And it's not necessarily saying that they don't have their place because they clearly do. They clearly do. But there are many people who who simply aren't 
going to show that on a test. And just to quickly add here, you, you talk about this concept of, of kind of being responsive to a nutrient, even though these standardized tests are not going to show anything. And, and the interesting thing is, at least with thiamine, this is certain, is that the evidence quite clearly suggests that one can be technically deficient in a certain sense, in a singular organ. And so, for instance, the brain. If you look at some compartments of the brain, you can have a deficit or an impairment in how those cells use thiamine and therefore how they make energy. And yet that's not widespread. That's not going to be applicable in other tissues. That's where it gets really fascinating. For instance, in Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, particularly Parkinson's, the rate at which these thiamine-dependent processes or this, let's say this localized deficiency in the substantia nigra, which is the area of the brain which makes dopamine, basically. And that's the area of the brain that, that degenerates in Parkinson's disease. Well, they found that the, let's say, the reduction in thiamine-dependent processes correlates or tracks very closely with the severity of Parkinson's disease. And so if you look at some of the conditions which can treat, or which you can treat with high-dose thiamine, there seems to be a... Uh, you know, an overlap between the reduction in thiamine de dependent processes in those areas of the body, but that's not going to show up on a test. You know, let's say you do an organic acids test. You're looking at, say, uh, la urinary lactate, pyruvate, and alpha ketoglutarate. Those are the typical markers you might see in someone who's classically deficient in B1. But if you've just got an aberrant kind of processing in one region of the brain, that's not going to affect the systemic level of metabolites. And that's where I think functional medicine goes wrong when it comes to assessing vitamin status. It doesn't really acknowledge the concept of a localized mm. deficiency or an impairment in utilization. And I think that's what we see in a lot of the cases where people may not have shown up as deficient on a test, yet can almost go into remission with high doses of that particular nutrient. And this seems to harken to one of the concepts that I, I initially heard from you, which is there might be two groupings, people who are deficient and need to replete the vitamin status with vitamin B1 thiamine. And those who need thiamine more like a drug that's correcting some sort of aberrant metabolism or function. Yeah, and that I, I personally think that that's the most interesting concept uh, because it really kind of just throws away the concept of deficiency. It's like, hey, okay, so people can be deficient, but then you can also have a subset of people who have enough coming in through their diet they're not classically deficient in the traditional sense, yet they require this, uh, almost works like a drug. And the, the basic concept is, is that, you know, when we think of deficiency, uh, we automatically assume that it means that someone is not consuming it in the food that they eat, or maybe they're consuming something which is depleting that in their body. Like in the context of vitamin B1, it would be a high white rice consumption, uh, back in Japan or anywhere where the rice is not fortified with thiamine can lead to and, and is very com commonly leads to a deficiency in B1 because you need B1 to process the sugar and white rice has had all of the B vitamins um, destroyed because you, you basically just remove the starch. And so uh, when you consume the pure starch or pure sugar when it's in its refined form and you're not having enough thiamine, well, that can induce a deficiency. Likewise, if you consume alcohol, well, alcohol destroys thiamine, it impairs the uptake of thiamine. So these are like external factors, or let's say dietary factors, which are potentially going to induce a deficiency. But what you're talking about there is a completely different concept. Again, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, in that there are other things which aren't very well acknowledged, especially by the uh, medicinal community, let's say. Um, and these factors, it can involve genetics, so it can be the transport and uptake of thiamine into the cell. Some people have uh, genetic polymorphism, which haven't actually been very well characterized. It might be that they're not able to get thiamine into certain regions of the body. It might be that they are not able to activate it, or it might be that they're not able to properly utilize it at the cellular level. Or even to make things a little bit more complicated, which I think is probably more common, it has been shown that if we look at how thiamine is used by cells, uh, just to give your listeners a bit of an overview, uh, it, it's really important for how our cells are making energy. And the reason for that is, is because it's, a, it's, a, it's what's called a cofactor for different enzymes, and those enzymes are needed for our mitochondria to take fat, carbohydrate, and protein and actually convert that into usable ATP. And what's very special about thiamine, and I personally find it, I, I feel like thiamine is quite unique in this respect, in that three of the enzymes which are, or two of the enzymes which 
depend on thymine, they're called thymine-dependent enzymes, are what you also call rate-limiting enzymes. What I mean by that is that when those enzymes stop working, you think of uh, the way in which your cells make energy for the listeners, it's like multiple different cogs in a machine. In that when you spin, when, to make energy, you need all of those cogs spinning, and all of those cogs require different nutrients. They're called cofactors. So these rate-limiting enzymes, when they slow down because of a deficit in thymine or for some other reason, and there's, there are other reasons, then every other step slows down. So it doesn't matter whether you have enough B3 or B6 or B12 or folate. If you don't have enough thymine, you are not making energy, full stop. And that is why thymine is really so central to energy metabolism because of those rate-limiting enzymes. So to introduce a little bit more complexity here, if we look at disease processes, disease processes can actually have an inhibitory effect on those rate-limiting enzymes. So you've got one called pyruvate dehydrogenase, another one called alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Both are exquisitely sensitive to toxins, to heavy metals, to oxidative stress, to neuroinflammatory compounds. So for instance, if someone has intestinal permeability, if they have leaky blood-brain barrier, they have all of these things, and you end up with this state of chronic inflammation, then your, your glial cells or your immune cells in your brain are releasing these, these compounds. These compounds inhibit those rate-limiting enzymes. And what I'm trying to get at here is that if you look at the disease process or the molecular characteristics of different types of diseases, what you often find is an inhibition of those thymine-dependent enzymes. And why is that relevant? Well, that's relevant because it produces the equivalent of a thymine deficiency at the cellular level, even if someone has a good intake from the diet. Does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. And in parallel to that, I remember you also remarking that in your research, you've come across stressors, not limited to inflammation, but including inflammation, seem to reduce thiamine either absorption or no, they, they, they tax and they, they cause an increased utilization of thiamine across mammals and plant species. It's, it's sort of conserved across many different lines of life, if you will. Is that, is my understanding there correct? Yeah, and this is something that uh, there's a there's a body of evidence which really makes me think. It's something that I I had, you know, there was Dr. Daryl Lonsdale. He he's basically what you would call the pioneer or the founding father of high dose thiamine therapy, at least in the West. So he was conversing with many of the doctors in Japan in you know from the 1970s onwards, and he started using it in high doses, and he really characterized a lot of this stuff. Bless his heart, he actually died earlier this year at the age of 100 years old. Um, so, so he's written several books on thiamine, and, and he w would also speak about how there was something quite unique about vitamin B1 and, and how it is so central to energy metabolism. There's something really quite unique about it. Now, when you dig into the evidence, um, you find that this, this is conserved among multiple different types of living organisms, ranging from bacteria to fungi to, um, to mammalian cells to plants. What you see is that when organisms as a whole, let's say, across the spectrum are, are exposed to any kind of stress, and we're not just talking about psychological, emotional stress for humans, we're talking about any kind of anything which, defining it in the terms of anything which places a demand on the cell, okay? So in plants, in fungi, in bacteria, and in, in humans, what you see, one of the first responses is to increase the availability of thiamine. So humans can't synthesize thiamine, but, but certain plants and bacteria can. So when they're exposed to any kind of stressful event, and this is multiple different things, they will increase the uptake of thiamine, they will increase the synthesis of thiamine, and they will increase the thiamine-dependent processes in the cell. And this is ultimately to uh, provide, provide adaptation to stress. So, so if you look at the plant literature, they refer to vitamin B1 as an anti-stress molecule. Now, if you see, you look at what happens in human cells, well, you know, let's say the prototype, prototypical type of stress for human cells is, is a lack of oxygen, right? Hypoxia. Now, one of the first things that cells will do when they're exposed to hypoxia is rapidly increase the uptake. They'll suck thymine from, from their local environment. They'll suck it up. And they do that via increasing the expression of thymine transporters. And so there seems to be this very strong overlap between st stress, adaption, adaptation to stress, and thymine um, stores. And I think this is what, hap what is happening in, in chronic diseases. 
when we whether it's CFS, fibromyalgia, the complex conditions like Lyme, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, I believe that these these this combination of of, of stressors is causing a depletion of thiamine at the cell level because thiamine is necessary for adaptation to stress. Yeah, and no, I love it. And the way I think about this as a clinician, sometimes you, you use antimicrobial therapy for Lyme, for SIBO, for Candida, and it's just a home run. And, and we see the response that we should see, which is month over month improvement. And sure, there might be a couple of speed bumps along the way, but the general macro trend is up and to the right clearly. Then there are those that they plateau at a very low level or there's just inconsistent or, or minimal response. And I, I wonder, and this is what we're starting to experiment with in the clinic, how many of these people have another layer to the equation where this chronic stress from, let's say, candida or SIBO, candida will produce acid aldehyde, which ironically requires vitamin B1, amongst others, to metabolize it. So if someone's had a long-term fungal overgrowth, that's going to exacerbate the depletion of thiamine through the stress of the candida and the immune stimulation and through the metabolism of acid aldehyde. SIBO may lead to a malabsorption syndrome and also inflammation. So, you know, again, I think there's a lot of implications here regarding making sure we're using or at least thinking about thiamine when people are not seeing the really clear response to, let's say, diet, lifestyle, and antimicrobial therapy. And I think we took this stat from some of your work, but there was a, just a sort of juxtapose, well, what does dietary intake look like? A 2011 NHANES data set, 16,000 people, and they found regarding dietary intake, 56% were not getting adequate dietary thiamine or B1 in their diet. So it does seem there's a case to be made here that foundationally, people are probably not eating their way into sufficiency of thiamine. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. For sure. And and the, those those studies, so the RDA is what sits between one milligram or 1 1.5 milligrams per day, depending on where you're looking. Um, what those studies don't actually show or don't I think there would be a difficult way to measure this, but there, if you if you were to c contrast that with the intake of refined um, carbohydrates or, or fats or proteins, anything refined food, not only is how to say this. Basically, you've got a problem of low intake to begin with, but but then what you've also got a problem with in the Western world, at least, is this intake of refined. Um, foods, primarily carbohydrates, which further places a demand on the thiamine that you have, you know, b right. because you think of your, your thiamine tank, let's say, well, it's really meant to be matched with the, um, with the intake of macronutrients because you need uh, the micronutrients to process the macronutrients in the first place. So if you have people, a large swathe of the population, which is true, who do not even meet that, that RDA, but then at the same time, you've got them consuming massive amounts of refined starches, sugars, et cetera. That's further going to place a burden on it. So I believe that the the real, um, the 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 actual situation on the ground is, is potentially even worse than it looks in the studies. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, especially when we add stress from how much people work or... I think people drink too much oftentimes in Western societies, especially when you're younger. Caffeine is another factor. Exercise is another. And these things, you know, they're all healthy stressors. But to your point, how much allostatic load can the organism take before it starts to manifest signs and symptoms of deficiency? And I guess with that, um, a challenge, I think, is so many of these syndromes have symptomatic overlap. Are there some key characteristics that help you distinguish a suspicion of thiamine deficiency? Yeah, that it's interesting. So, um, yes, there are. There are three main systems which are going to be affected in a classical thiamine deficiency, let's say. And sometimes it's difficult to determine if someone is classically deficient or whether they are someone who has like a responsive condition, which is a little bit more complicated. But yeah, so that's going to be the brain, first of all, the uh Actually, I say the brain, but really the nervous system. So that can be central or peripheral nervous system. And that means that kind of the umbrella covers any problem with the autonomic nervous system as well. And really, this is I, I feel that this is going to be the main sign and symptom. Any Anyone with any kind of problem with autonomic nervous system regulation. So if your listeners, they might not know what that means. It's basically all of the non-conscious processes. So your heart rate, your body temperature, your... Um, everything that goes on that you don't have to think about that is ultimately um, keeping you alive. 
So any problem with the autonomic nervous system that is clinically referred to as dysautonomia, um, but it can be very mild. So someone may not be diagnosable. Issues with the brain, because the brain is perhaps the most sensitive organ to thiamine deficiency. And one of the main areas that thiamine deficiency will affect are the lower brain regions, which are responsible for controlling that autonomic nervous system. Likewise, the peripheral nerves. So the peripheral nerves not only require a lot of energy, and we know that thiamine is important for energy, but also nerve transmission, so neurotransmission, is also dependent via non-coenzyme effects. So thiamine is, is central, almost synonymous with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is how your nerves tell your organs what to do and at what times. And if you don't have acetylcholine, then your organs don't know what to do at what times and they start doing funny things. So <laughs> that's an easy way to conceptualize it. And the heart. So you've got your brain, you've got your nervous system, peripheral nerves, and the heart. Now, these are the classical thiamine deficiency syndromes. They're referred to as venic encephalopathy in the brain, uh, dry beriberi in the peripheral nerves, and wet beriberi in the heart. However, there is another type of beriberi, which is vastly under-recognized, but we know that it's probably the most common. It's just not been very well characterized in the literature, and that is gastrointestinal beriberi. And the gastrointestinal system, I like to think of it not as its individual system, but as a compartment or as a, an, a branch of the autonomic nervous system, because, you know, the brain has to communicate to the gut what to do and at what times. Now, although it can function semi-autonomously, as we know, um, when there is any problem with the communication between the brain and the gut, that you can end up with many manifestations, which I think we I think we misdiagnose sometimes, or at least I know, I know that at least a portion of people are misdiagnosed. Um, and that is through experience with many hundreds, probably thousands now in terms of my overall network of people, thousands of people who've treated their gut problems with taking thiamine. And there's, if you look in the literature, it's, it's very far between people who've been making connections. It's really under-recognized. But the way I like to think of it is that if there's any problem with how your nerves co communicate to whichever part of the body, then then thiamine could be involved. Um, also, I mean, to get non-specific, really any any condition which involves an impairment in energy metabolism or mitochondrial function, thiamine could be implicated in that because of its central role in how mitochondria work and make energy. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, a few threads there to pick up on. Uh, I, I really thought the conversation with Dr. Alex Ford, who's on your side of the pond over at University of Leeds, talking about amitriptyline as a drug therapy, but nevertheless, a drug therapy that's efficacious for IBS, which is being IBS reclassified as disordered gut brain interaction. So, you know, so much of even this, what we used to think was a gut issue is being reclassified as sort of gut brain. And obviously the autonomic nervous system is very important in regulation of things like motility and the limbic system. And the limbic system does impact the inflammatory response to anything that leaks through the gut. And as a realist, there's probably going to be a small degree of leaky gut in most people, um, coming back to what you said earlier about a spectrum or a continuum. So if some of that is normal, so to speak, air quotes, if the limbic system is overactive, then there's an, an exacerbated inflammatory response to the things that leak through. So that's, I think, part of what we see in this syndrome of disordered gut-brain interaction. It's autonomic nervous system, vagal function, motility, and immune function. And then we could even layer in along with that people who might have ruminating behavior. And I'm sure you see a lot of this where they're just so attentive to their diet or their health. And it, it starts to really sort of put them into a stressed out state chronically because they're so, uh, dare I say, obsessed for lack of a better term about their health. And some of that might really be due to what's going on in the ANS. And we know that dysautonomia amongst other things can cause manifestations like anxiety. So there's this whole right. sort of gut brain interaction storm yep. And uh, with the nervous system too, the peripheral nerves, when we were at the clinic looking into this, we said, boy, there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms of Lyme disease or vector-borne infections and thiamine deficiency. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the, the, one, the one issue I still have with some pockets of the Lyme community, and I say this as someone who's 
you know, now a member of iLads and sort of wading my way into that community. And it's not a criticism, it's just an observation, I would say. It's easy for me to stand on the shoulders of people who've been pioneering this work for decades, right? So it's not a criticism, but I do wonder if in some cases, and you hear these stories from some patients, they're a year plus into aggressive antibiotic therapy with not much response at all. And I wonder if what's happening is the Lyme diagnosis and treatments being thrust upon someone and maybe after a few months into the Lyme treatment, if there's not response, that's where a deviation over to thiamine would make sense. Have you seen cases like this? I'm sure at least anecdotally you've so heard. Many. So many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so many. Um, what you often find is people with chronic, f chronic inflammatory response syndrome or people with active Lyme or very, very often mold patients. So patients who've been given the diagnosis and told that their symptoms are primarily because of that, whether it's a, a stealth infection or whether it's because of uh, mycotoxins or the chronic inflammatory response that occurs because of those. Um, yeah, I, I've got, uh, you know, it, there's two groups of people. There's some which will respond remarkably to thiamine. And I think it probably comes down to uh, the relationship with the vagus nerve, um, how B1 is necessary for that cholinergic neurotransmission, the main neurotransmitter via the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is basically controlling systemic inflammation. It's, it's counteracting the sympathetic nervous system. It's involved in all of these resting, or these regenerative processes. Um, when someone is chronically low in B1, and that can happen because I think of a chronic infection, because of those factors that occur, even if they're eating enough in the diet, because their cells are under so much stress, what is happening is they are burning through their nutrition. And so there are certainly people who respond marvelously. I can't say that it fixes the infection, but I've seen it on numerous occasions where it will fix many of the manifestations of the infection. And what it might do is actually facilitate the immune system to start utilizing its own antibiotic molecules to deal with it, resolve it. That said, I'm not sure if you're probably familiar with the concept of the cell danger response, right? Um, I wanted to talk about this. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. Now, that is something that does also seem to be relevant, and I don't know how to understand that. Uh, I think if you look at Navio's theory and, and the way that he's characterized the different stages of the CDR, I think it's possible that giving thiamine at the wrong time can make things worse. And this is a little bit uh, of a controversial topic, but that is something that you do see. You know, you've got someone with the test results which show massive mitochondrial dysfunction, major deficiencies across the board, and yet you give them thiamine, which would usually, or which in many cases would bring them out of this state of disrepair, well, ultimately, uh, it can actually make them significantly worse. And there are people who have tried it for many months. And I believe that if they're stuck in this state of, of chronic inflammation or danger mode, let's say at the cellular level, then I think the thiamine can potentially make them worse. Now that's not to say that it's not going to help them at some point to help bring them out. Sure. But I think that in someone who has a raging infection or they're living in a very moldy uh, apartment or something, and yet and they've not really done much work on that. I, th I think those people sh are not candidates for this kind of therapy. Precisely, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think we wanna go after overt SIBO, candida, or an infection, and at least reduce the load as much as we reasonably mm -hmm. can, or if it's mold, get them out of the environment, and then consider going into the thiamine therapeutics. And, and let's talk a little bit more about mitochondrial dysfunction, because it, it's funny, as I've been studying some of your work and just sort of going through some observations globally, I'm thinking more about how mitochondria could be a missing piece for the people who don't fully respond. And I was at the Gastro AMP at Seattle discussing with Alana Gurevich, who's a naturopathic GI, very similar concepts in terms of there's something here with the mitochondria and we're trying to figure out what's the best time and method to try to restore mitochondrial function. And, and for the audience, the cell danger response is essentially the mitochondria, for lack of a more medical scientific term, downregulate or, or disinhibit themselves or inhibit themselves due to inflammation and stress. And what may happen is people get stuck in sort of this low energy state because the mitochondrial function doesn't come back online. Um, one thing I'll add to this as we sort of uh, dive more deeply I had done about two months ago a course on high pressure hyperbaric oxygen, 2.4 atmosphere, 100% O2, 90 minutes. 
during that same time I was doing ketosis, in fact, I've been doing ketosis for the past a little over two months, it was so much easier for me to get into deep ketosis when I was doing hyperbaric oxygen. That got me thinking about mitochondria, fatty acid oxidation, and I've mentioned the podcast before, I'm starting to wonder if people who remark, I just can't go low carb, you know, if they're doing it correctly, if they're not under eating, if they're not under eating fat, if they're getting electrolytes, and if those basics are, are checked, and they still don't respond, I wonder if that's demonstrative of mitochondrial dysfunction. And I know you had said somewhere that when you're suspecting a mitochondrial problem, you pause in the thiamine, at least I think anyway, and you go into things like fasting, NAD, resveratrol. So tell me more about um, what you're doing. Let's say, and we'll come to the thiamine protocol in a little bit, but someone starts on thiamine, don't see the response that we want to see, maybe even a negative response, paradoxical response. Now you're thinking, let's pivot over to mitochondria. What are the things you found to be most effective? Um, so, so you're talking about specifically in the context of someone who I don't think will respond, who's tried it, and yet it hasn't, it, it's actually had a negative effect? Is yeah, is that how you typically see it manifest? Is it, is it negative responses that you're looking as an indication that there might be something thwarting mitochondrial health? Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or no response at all, right? Okay. Now, um, the negative response, I think looking at at least Navio's theory, it, it, it lines up with with what I've seen clinically. And the, the, the concept is, I think, and again, I'm not a specialist on mitochondria, but I don't want to butcher what he said. Although from what I understand, you know, if you think of mitochondria, when you give agents which can stimulate that because of the the different configuration you've got the m2 m0 m m1 configuration of mitochondria in in certain cases when let's say the cell perceives danger by stimulating uh, oxidative phosphorylation by giving high doses of nutrients which either stimulate the krebs cycle or giving things like coq10 what can potentially happen is that you 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 get a, you get a flow of electrons through the mitochondria, but you actually get a spitting out, so you get reverse electron transport and actually increasing oxidative stress. And this seems to be probably the only thing which I can which I can explain the only way that I can explain some of the symptoms that some people will get when they try this therapy. Because what you'll find in some cases, for instance, in chronic fatigue syndrome, you can see some people who have um, made major strides in improving their condition, and yet they try high dose thiamine or really anything which is classically associated with mitochondrial stimulation, let's say, um, and they can, they can regress quite significantly. And this is one of the reasons why um why i don't recommend high doses to start off with these days i used to many years ago and then and then i actually i i you know sorry to to my clients at the time but um but i learned the hard way and so did other people that if you go too hard on it too too quickly um then then it can it can really set people back and i think it's probably just because it causes massive oxidative stress because the mitochondria are not geared up to to generating energy in that way in that in that moment in time so in that kind of situation i would be again a lot of this is theoretical because a lot of this stuff you just simply can't test for um what I would be looking at is considering, okay, well, if this if someone has had a long history of, let's say, some kind of environmental toxicity, they've had a long history of, uh, they've, they've had a, some kind of a drug reaction, let's say, to fluoroquinolone antibiotics, to metronidazole, which are known to cause widespread mitochondrial damage, I'm going to be considering that this person's mitochondria might just be so absolutely screwed up um, that whatever you're doing is, is potentially making it worse. And so in that case, I would try to implement therapies which can stimulate mitochondrial uh, biogenesis, making new mitochondria, and then stimulating autophagy, which is basically or mitophagy which is clearing out damaged and defective mitochondria. And that is where something like fasting comes in, as where something like sauna comes in. Um, some of those supplements, so resveratrol does seem to have that effect, although I'm not a massive fan of it. Um, but there are other things like nicotinamide um, riboside or nicotinamide mononucleotide. These things taken at certain times in the day in combination with a fasted state. Um, certain types of exercise, if someone has energy for that. As I said, a sauna or some kind of a detoxification protocol, things which have been known to stimulate that process of autophagy, basically clearing out dead, dead 
components of the cell, uh, which may be preventing or preventing someone's recovery, and then trying to provide as much raw material and, and the right kind of stimulus to uh, allow their bodies to make new mitochondria so that when you are giving therapies which can stimulate or readdress mitochondrial function, uh, you're not getting that, th those, those kind of negative symptoms. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so you're kind of looking at mitochondrial supports in, in two camps. One is stimulating autophagy and, and biogenesis, and the other right. is facilitation of just, you know, the electron transport chain or the Krebs cycle, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the ones that you like for biogenesis, fasting, uh, NAD plus? Yeah, Are you a yeah. Fan of NAD, NAD resveratrol, um, sauna, infrared sauna. Um, mm -hmm. What about uh, a keto diet? Are you looking yeah. at that similar to... Fasting, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming it, it's it's context dependent, right? Um, and the reason I say that is because I have worked with a lot of people with very severe ME CFS, and in those people, honestly, um, many of them cannot do keto or low carb, and no matter what we try, um, they they feel they feel really bad when they do it, and and I think this ties back to what you said is that for some people, it seems as though you need a kind of baseline level of, of mitochondrial function to be able to have that metabolic flexibility to shift between carbohydrate and, and fat metabolism. And I think that some people are, are so kind of impaired in that respect that they need some kind of simple carbohydrate or sugars. Because the fact is, you can make energy via glycolysis outside the mitochondria. And that's, that's not necessarily you're doing that. But still... Um, simple sugars appear to be easier on, on metabolism than, than long chain fats or whatever. They require less steps to, to be burned for energy. And it does seem to be the case that in some people, they can't adapt to keto as something we'd like to move towards, especially if they've had a long history of, of chronic disease, but it's really context dependent. But I mean, keto is, is, is an excellent way. And that would really go hand in hand with fasting. And on top of keto, I would probably go for something more carnivorous as well, trying to remove all potential um, toxins or, or things that can trigger the inflammatory response, being plant toxins, lectins, oxalates, those kind of things, just for the sure. time being while they're trying to get back on track. Do you find that fasting is more tolerated than keto? Um, when it's time restricted, yeah, I think I think if it's time restricted, not necessarily like two or three day fasts for someone with who's bed bound. So but, maybe um, like a, an OMAD, like a one meal per day. Maybe or or, or not as long as they're not ca caloric restriction, or maybe there would be a small amount of caloric restriction, um, but not to the point where someone is going to be debilitated with fatigue or start to lose weight if they're not overweight. Um, but yeah, a, a, a mild a mild for. Uh, a, let's say a time restricted eating pattern where they're eating within eight hours or something like that, um, then keto. Yeah. I, it, it, again, it's context dependent, right? Some people just seem to require at least temporarily some kind of easy, easy broken down starch or, or fruit sugar sure. or something like that. Have you ventured at all into the world of peptides? There's um, 5 amino, 1 MQ, there's MOT C. These are two peptides that are supposed to help. Uh, at, at least the MOT C is purportedly going to increase fatty acid oxidation. Uh, I see there maybe being something here because sometimes peptides seem to help. It's, it's a very broad category. There's peptides for growth hormone and, and other things. I'm curious if you have any thoughts. Yeah, uh, about three months ago, I started delving into that. So I've been using some uh, growth hormone kind of mimetics, you might call them, analogs, uh, growth hormone promoters, things like that on oh, myself. Um, just, just to, just to test it out. Uh, I'm not in a position where I can legally recommend, you know, I'm a nutritionist, I'm not a medical doctor. And in at least where I, where I live, there's major legal restrictions, re what I can recommend. Now that's not to say that I don't put, send people in the right direction or make educational com comments. Uh, I, I'm interested in peptides for sure. It's something that I don't know enough about, probably because I, I knew at some point I'd never really be able to use it clinically, at least not directly. So it's something that I've not delved too much into outside of the context of my own health condition or situation. Uh, however, that said, on the topic of MOTC and cerebrolysin, I believe it's called, I've seen a, 
a really, really interesting case of a lady who was basically doing everything for chronic fa chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, after using a, a two month protocol or a one month protocol of MOTC, um, that basically put her into remission, which I found was fascinating. Um, and cerebrolysin, I've heard to be extremely useful for anyone with any kind of neuroinflammatory condition. Uh, many mold patients uh, who don't go through the whole uh, Richie Shoemaker protocol, but actually use individualized peptides, claim to have resolved their condition as well. And I've, you know, I've worked with a couple of people who have been doing that. So I am interested in it. Gotcha. And uh, do you know if people were dosing that? Because I believe cerebral license is oftentimes administered as a nasal spray. Right. Do you, um, happen, do you happen to know? I don't know. I know this is not, not your area. No, no worries. Okay. Let's go to the thymine repletion protocol because there's some nuance here that I think is important for people to understand. Uh, do you want to maybe give us the overview, the different types, and, and we can kind of talk through the dosing protocol? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. So when you're using thymine, you have to understand that there's different forms and each different form, not only... Okay. Going back to the 1960s, the Japanese uh, thymine deficiency was widespread in Japan from... Uh, very long time ago, hundreds of years, uh, since they started polishing their rice, basically, removing the outer husk, removing the B vitamins. And um, and so they they witnessed large-scale thymus deficiency among their population. Um, this spurred them on to do a lot of research into finding how to um, basically synthesize different derivatives which could improve thymus uptake into, different, into the body. Now, because thymus uh, in its... Nutritional form, the way that you would get it nutritionally or in most supplements, thiamine salts, they're called, so thiamine hydrochloride mononitrate, um, their absorption into the body is limited by what are called saturable transport proteins. So these transport proteins are essentially, um, they can accept so much into the blood, but then after a certain level, they, they kind of shut down, they have to regenerate. So because they're saturable, that means that if you give consistent doses of these forms, then a lot of it is just going to be excreted. So what they did was they synthesized, they took the thiamine molecule and they added lots of different types of chemical groups to it. And they found that certain ones could increase the uh, absorption into cells, into the blood and into the brain uh, by bypassing those transporters. And that's what we're left with today. There's three main uh, uh, derivatives, let's call them, which can basically help you get thiamine from the supplement and directly into your organs really quickly and really well. So one of those is called benfotiamine. That's most studied in the West. And there's lots of different companies that make that. That's awesome. Uh, it's very good for peripheral neurological problems. So if someone has any kind of neuropathy, chronic pain, many patients with fibromyalgia do really well with benfotiamine and also CFS, so chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, benfotiamine is one that can get past the, the cell membrane and it can get into the brain, although it previously wasn't thought that it could. We know that it can and it's being studied in Alzheimer's. Another one is much less, less well-known, um, although it's favored in the East. So benfotiamine is favored in the West, whereas this form is favored in Japan and in China and in Korea. This is called TTFD. Um, the long name is thymotetrahydrofurfural disulfide. It's a bit of a mouthful. But ultimately what this is, is a thymine molecule attached with a sulfur group. And that sulfur group is very interesting because what happens is it gets directly into the blood, directly into the brain, or into the cells. And when it gets into the cells, you get a detachment of the sulfur group. And the sulfur group essentially acts like a bit, bit like an antioxidant, stimulates the NRF pathway, and increases the production of glutathione and things in the cells. So this form I, I find most clinically relevant for gut problems, uh, SIBO, um, uh, uh, hypochloridria, anything with the gut, the enteric nervous system, this form is probably the best, and anything directly relate, pertaining to the brain. Um, so if you've got someone with Parkinson's disease or MS or any kind of like anxiety or any kind of uh, central nervous system disorder, epileptic seizures, this form is really, really good for that. Uh, but again, like benfotiamine, it can be used with other conditions as well. And then finally, you have solbutiamine, and this is similar to TTFD, although it has slightly different effects. And so uh, I think that's a general overview. And from what I've gathered, you recommend that if someone's sensitive, reactive, start with the thiamine HCL, the less absorbed type, because it's going to give you a little bit more governing of absorption, if you will, and, and has less of a tendency towards side effects. Yeah. So for the vast majority of people, 
if they don't have like a severe health condition, then they could probably just start with uh, any form. And we have a lot of people who buy, you know, I, I make a company or I own a company that we make thiamine derivatives. And most of our cu customers, we don't hear from them. We just get good reviews. We don't have any negative comments about side effects. So these people just take the derivatives and they're fine. Um, however, when you're dealing with people with severe chronic health issues, like, you know, I know that you deal with, I've dealt with, um, with these people, there seems to be the case that there is what's called the paradoxical reaction. And the paradoxical reaction was identified as early as like 1910 or 1920. Um, and it was more well characterized by Dr. Daryl Lonsdale. What he found was that the people who need thiamine the most, if they have very severe deficiency, then they tend to get um, a worsening of their symptoms, their presenting symptoms early on when they start thiamine. And the way to resolve that or the way to deal with that is to start at a very low dose. Now, unfortunately, if someone is, it's almost like if their system is become so used to using as little thiamine as possible and then they're in this kind of compromised state, then when you give a large dose or you give a, a potent form, then that can kind of be like a shock to the system and you can get all these weird signs and symptoms. And so uh, there's many the theories for why that is. We don't know exactly what happens. However, to mitigate that or to avoid that, what I like to do is I like to use or recommend forms that are not as bioavailable. Now, it might not make sense to people because they might think, well, why would I take a less efficient form? Why would I do that? Well, the reason is it's almost like sending a signal to the body that, you're starting to intake more of this nutrient and it's almost as if the body needs time to prepare for that. You know, that's the way that I like to explain it to people. The, the body has time to prepare for it and that kind of like drip feeds the system so that your metabolic systems can gear up towards dealing with more potent thiamine derivatives. So you start with a low dose of thiamine hydrochloride. Whenever you use thiamine, you always use a B-complement complex and magnesium behind it. And the theory for, for why that might be, well, magnesium is necessary for all of these steps that thiamine is necessary for, is needed for the activation of thiamine inside the cell, etc. And magnesium is, is super important. So when you take thiamine by itself, it can increase the demand for magnesium. But come back to our little analogy where you have the cell as this kind of, this factory or this machine with all these different cogs, all these cogs use different nutrients, is that when you stimulate some pathways, you are potentially increasing the demand for the other nutrients as well. That's why B-complex should always be taken behind it. So you start very low. And when you say behind, can can you dose this all at the same time? Or do you literally yeah. mean yeah. wait like an hour? Yeah, you, you just can, mean all, all together. You right. can dose it all together. You know, for someone who's sensitive, if you have someone with CFS, mold illness, anything like that, or just like a neuropathy or any kind of presenting health condition, what you want to do, get them on a low dose thiamine, thiamine hydrochloride, a B-complex and magnesium that they can they take it all, all at the same time. And when I say low dose, you know, depending on the sensitivity of the and the constitution of the, the patient, um, you might want to start them at like 50 milligrams of thiamine hydrochloride. Now, 50 milligrams, generally about 10% of that is going to be absorbed. That's five milligrams probably. And see how they respond. If they respond okay to that, they might not notice anything. You can double the dose. Same thing, double the dose, double the dose. Like weak increments, roughly speaking? It depends. Uh, right, based on their constitution. So if you've got someone who's very sensitive, you might want to do it every couple of days, like doubling the 50 milligram dose. So you would give them 100 milligrams and the amount that they'll actually be getting in the body is 10 milligrams. However, when you're coming to like... Um, when when you've got someone who who is fairly confident or you feel confident that they they didn't respond negatively to the 50 milligrams you might want to double the dose the next day or you might want to sell, tell them on the same day hey take another dose of this and, and keep building them up now when they get to about 300 400 milligrams of thiamine hydrochloride you can be fairly sure that they're going to do okay on a derivative so at that point you can then switch and you can go in with one of the derivatives based on their presenting health condition the type of derivative that you're going to use is based on their health condition. So for instance, if you've got something which is primarily peripheral based, you know, like neuropathy, you're going to want to go in heavy with benfotiamine. On the other hand, if you've got someone with like chronic digestive issues, which don't respond to antimicrobials, you're going to want to go in with TTFD. So, so depending on the type of condition depends on the form. At the same time, you might also then want to start mixing and matching. So you have some people with POTS, They've got the central nervous system problem, but then they've also got peripher peripheral neuropathy. So what you might want to do is actually mix 400 milligrams of benfotiamine with 100 milligrams of TTFD, and you might find that both of those symptoms start to dissolve at the same time. 
you know so so it really depends sure. on on the situation and that seems to be at least inferring from looking at some of your literature you like to do the combination of benfo and ttfd for most people and i think you have a product that's a mixture of the two yeah 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 and how is and that it, ratioed yeah, it, so yeah people often ask this question they'll say what's the equivalence you know, so if I'm taking 500 milligrams of benfotiamine, what's the equivalent in TTFD or what's the equivalent in thiamine hydrochloride? And it's it's not really possible to answer or, that so, question. I'm, I'm sorry, not, not to cut you off, but I, I more so mean, it seems like at least looking at your, what we took from your dosing recommendations, up to 1200 milligrams of benfotiamine and about 500 milligrams of TTFD. So you, you seem to favor the benfo over the TTFD when you're working people onto both of these. Yeah, okay. So- yeah. Okay. So, so basically, benfotiamine. It seems as though you need it. You need it in a higher dose to have the same effect. So, TTFD seems to be the most potent. We don't know why that is. It seems to be way more potent at a much lower dose. So, some some people can have a hundred milligrams of TTFD, and that and that's way too much, or that's that's enough. They might need six hundred or eight hundred milligrams of benfotiamine to achieve the same effect or achieve a similar effect. And so so that document that I made, or it might be a lecture that you watched of mine, that that's what that's looking at is the average effective dose. And what you see is if you look at the literature of how these thiamine derivatives work, they're not just providing thiamine into the cell, right? They're actually having these probably what you call pleiotropic effects or non-coenzymatic effects where the actual additional group or the molecule itself is having a, a, a unique effect on the cell that isn't found with thiamine. That's what you see with TTFD. So thiamine itself is not very good at like increasing motility, gut motility unless it's there's a severe deficiency. However, TTFD is very good at doing that. Like if there is impaired motility, even if it's not because of a deficiency, TTFD can restore the motility. And so, um, and, and it's not just an indiscriminate laxative effect as well, because if motility is not impaired, the research shows that TTFD doesn't do anything. So what it seems to be doing is like having a direct effect on enteric neurons. So there's, there's, the, sorry, long story short, what, what I mean is the reason we mix forms is because they seem to have unique effects aside from their ability just to give thiamine to the cells. And so those unique effects, rather than choosing one or the other, it's actually, um, it's useful to mix and match them to say, well, hey, okay, if we know benfotiamine can stimulate this pathway or it can reduce pain via this pathway, and then uh, TTFD can improve a uh, cholinergic transmission in this respect, and this form can give thiamine to this area of the body or whatever. Then we combine them, and and that that's why I made thiamega to kind of put them all in one and and let people get all the benefits in that respect. Right, right. Now the other side of the coin is when to know if this therapy is not for you. And I, I'm putting aside some other sort of infection, inflammatory issue working through the paradoxical response, all those things we've we've addressed. Now it's more of a, okay, when do we adjudicate if this is helping me or not? And, and from what I took from your literature, if someone hits a total dose of 2,000 milligrams and there's not any change, it's not the therapeutic for them. Can you clarify or, or expound upon that? Yeah, so there are some people who come across the idea that they can use high dose thiamine to address their condition. And unfortunately, probably in the majority of people, that's not the case. Um, so, and as you probably know, patients, when they have these kind of complex health conditions, they will search, they'll do lots of searching and they'll look everywhere and try to find all any solution that they can find. So in terms of knowing when it is and isn't for you, um, like I said, when we were talking about people who have negative reactions, um, I would say the worst possible reaction that you could have is no reaction at all. And these people will sometimes try very high doses for prolonged periods of time. Exactly how to determine if someone is not going to respond or not is, is, is very difficult. There's no exact science on this. So the numbers that I give in that document are really just what I found personally. And that's from people who've come to me and they've said, hi, Elliot, I have this condition and I tried high dose thiamine. I tried the thiamine, I tried TTFD, I tried benfotiamine, I tried a combination of them all, I, tried, I did all the cofactors, and I still didn't see any change in my fatigue. At that point, I would say, okay, well, if you reach a dose of 2000 milligrams or something of combined forms, it's probably not going to affect you. However, to complicate this a little bit further, some of the research, um, just for your listeners, 
there, there was research from a, a neurologist named Dr. Anto Antonio Cosentini. He had been um, using high dose thiamine in Parkinson's disease and in fibromyalgia. Now, particularly in fibromyalgia, they found up to an 80% improvement almost overnight. But to make things difficult, this wasn't a, a linear improvement that they found as they increased the dose. They started at 500 milligrams. They saw no change. They did 1,000 milligrams, no change. 1,500 milligrams, no change. The only time they saw a change in symptoms was when they got up to 1.8 grams per day. And for two of the patients at 1.8 grams, their symptoms almost disappeared overnight. What that demonstrates is that there is a very specific threshold dose. And we don't know what that threshold is for each different person. And honestly, it can be quite high for some people. Now, I, have a, I had a lady with the ulcerative colitis who put her condition into complete remission with 2,000 milligrams. Until she got to 2,000 milligrams, there was no change. When she got to 2,000 milligrams, she went into clinical remission. I can't explain how that happens. <laughs> I have theories, but all, all we know is clinically there is a threshold dose and that can differ from person to person. So some people it can be 500, some people, I've not seen it anywhere above 2000 milligrams. And that's why I put out that number, 2000 milligrams. If you don't know it's any change whatsoever, then it might not be the therapy for you. However, I just want to add a caveat here is that sometimes people will read online and they'll, they'll try it at one individual form and they'll find that actually um, that, that form no, provides no benefit. And then what they'll do is they'll switch to a different form and they'll notice night and day improvement. And so what I would say is for someone to be able to determine if they're going to respond, they should give a good trial to three different forms. One being thiamine hydrochloride. Thiamine hydrochloride is needed in much higher doses than the other forms. You can go as high as 4,000 milligrams per day. Benfotiamine, like I said, you would want to go, you could go beyond 2,000 milligrams. There's no toxicity or it's very difficult to reach toxic dose. So you could go way beyond 2,000 milligrams. Um, but yeah. A TTFD, rarely you're going to need above 500 milligrams for that. Um, but you should give a good therapeutic kind of trial for each of those three different forms because you might be a responder to just one of them. And are you favoring trialing them individually or, you know, as, as like a broad starting point protocol, do you use a combo form or do you like using them individually? As a broad starting protocol, I will try them individually on a low dose based on their health condition. So, like I said, this kind of affinity of the different forms for different organs, based on their presenting their their presentation, uh, I I would recommend I, I would determine a form based on that and their history. However, um, when they get to a certain point of any megadose protocol, so you see on that document that I have, I have like a sensitive protocol, I have megadose protocol. I don't know if you saw that, but in the megadose protocol, I use all forms regardless. So if they tolerate a, a good high dose, if they tolerate a couple of hundred milligrams of any type of derivative, I will gradually start layering in all of the different thiamine derivatives just to make sure that we're hitting all of those bases. Because if they are someone who is going to respond very positively to one form, but actually they might benefit from another th form, I, I just want to make sure that we've got everything across the board. Okay, okay. And you're saying that you don't need to be on the the mega dose, the high dose, the, the the pinnacle dose for very long to determine if it's going to help them. Is that a week? It sounds like it's pretty quick, but what time interval on said higher dose would you recommend before you jump to a different? <sighs> no, I, I would say at least two months. Mm, two months. Okay. Yeah, it can take two months for someone to see any change. Um, I have many, you know, I have a group on online that I set up specifically for people who have been trying this therapy, but a coming across difficulties. So they're having problems with other nutrient interactions or which form or, you know, paradoxical reactions. So that's on Facebook and there's 11,000 members in there at the moment. And we have a lot of those members who, um, who only saw changes in their main presenting health condition several months after starting the therapy. What they would usually see though, is prior to that is they will see some change. We're looking for any change whatsoever, whether that's slightly longer period sleeping, whether that's lower heart rate, whether that is any physiological parameter which improves in some way. It might be that there's someone, their main issue isn't fatigue, but they actually feel as though they've got a little bit more energy taking it. It's like when you see a slight improvement in any symptom, you know that there is potential for it to work on the main presenting condition. So let's say, you know, I've got a lady who's 
You know, her main issue was severe constipation and gastroparesis. She tried all the different protocols, got rid of infections, blah, 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 blah. It was still there. And she also had a little bit of anxiety. So she would start with thiamine. She'd start building up. And within a couple of weeks, she sees that her anxiety starts improving. But her constipation is still still solid. Whereas after six or seven weeks, that's when gut, mo gut motility, stomach motility start kicking into gear. And actually, her main presenting issue starts to resolve. The difference, difference was, was she saw something change in the first couple of weeks. So usually there should be something change, either positive or yeah. negative. And that tracks with my own clinical experience. You're not necessarily going to see everything resolved within the first month or two, but there should be some confident indication that you're improving. And if so, then you continue. I'm yeah. with you on that. Yeah. Okay. How do you look at the wean off? It, it seems coming back to what we had covered earlier, some people will regress and they're going to need longer term thiamine. That's sort of like the the drug group of, of how we're using it. And then there's the people who come off of it and they maintain their improvements, generally speaking, and that's those who repleted. But uh, any other tips or thoughts for people who are trying to navigate that? Yeah. The, the, so the best way to navigate it is to, um, okay, I'll give you a hypothetical scenario. You've got someone with mm, chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia combination. They have spent six weeks building up the dose. They finally find the dose, 1,000 milligrams of a uh, combination of different things with a couple of other supplements that manages to abolish their fatigue and their body pain by, say, 80%, right? They remain at that dose for two or three months. The only way to know whether you need that or not, is to gradually start weaning down. Don't immediately stop it, but wean down in the way that you weaned up. So let's say it took you three weeks to build up to your therapeutic dose. Spend three weeks trying to bring it down and then watch your symptoms. Some people will find that when they bring the symptoms down, that their, their health... Uh, condition doesn't decline and they actually don't require the thiamine anymore. And that's excellent. That's exactly what we want. We don't want people on this lifelong. That's the thing. It's like uh, some people complain about that. It's like, that's not what we're looking for. This is a temporary intervention. And the way that you know is when you stop taking it, if your symptoms don't come back, you know you don't need it. Now, it's very unfortunate that for some people, they need it for much longer periods of time. Now, that can be a year or even two years. But for those people, they still hope that they can bring the dose down. So it might be that they just need it at a sustained amount. And, you know, six months, a year, they start weaning down, the symptoms come back. However... Sorry, the symptoms don't come back. However, um, there are a subset of people, particularly those with the Parkinson's and some of the other conditions, that when they bring it down, they their symptoms always return. Um, those people, they're probably going to need it indefinitely because what we're looking at is a uh, some kind of a genetic problem or something where they can't utilize or handle thiamine for some reason or some kind of environmental toxin, which is blocking thiamine uh, metabolism at the cell level in specific organ, and they need consistent high doses to stimulate those those enzymes. Yeah, it makes complete sense. It's how we discuss probiotics also, which is just periodically be reassessing the withdrawal with the paradigm of you're not going to need these forever, most likely. It's, I think it's important as you're as you're suggesting that we don't create a perspective of dependence, but but rather most cases will be repletion and then removal but always on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, totally with you on all this. Um, what else? You know, as, as we sort of come to a close, I know you have a product line. You have um, some great materials out there. Where would you point people if they wanted more information? Yeah, um, so most people find me via my YouTube channel. Uh, I have a ton of free information on there. Uh, you can see over the years as I've kind of become more involved in, in trying to raise awareness of, of thiamine. I, um, I've got many lectures on there, several hours of lectures. I've got explainer videos. I've got interviews. You just type in Elliot Overton and you'll find tons of interviews with me talking about this topic if you want to learn more. Um, like I said, I do have a, a PDF document, which I made because I physically couldn't deal with the amount of patients who were getting in contact. Uh, when I stopped seeing people personally was, was when I had a, a more than a year it was like 18 months waiting list. So I had to actually just stop it and say, I need to reinvest my, re-inject my efforts into trying to raise more awareness rather than working on a one-to-one -one basis. So what I did was I, I published all of 
kind of the six years of things that I'd learned, almost everything I know about thiamine uh, from a clinical or practical perspective is in that document. And that can, includes why you're doing it, the different forms, where to get them, why to use them, under what circumstance, how to use them, what dose to use them at, uh, what, what conditions are responsive, the protocols for the conditions, testing for it, everything you need to know to basically get started. Or uh, if you're a practitioner, which a lot of the people who purchase that are practitioners, they use it in the practice. So it was really for the people who can't get a consultation. Um, and that that is where to get a lot of the practical information. Uh, I have a group on Facebook. It's called Addressing Thiamine Deficiency in the Paradoxical Reaction. Uh, like I said, a lot of the people on there are people who have tried this and yet they've had difficulty. So that's a way in which they can go. And there's, there's lots of people who've gone through this process. They've come out the other end. As you, you might know, is that when people address their problem they're usually not very interested in staying in these groups and things whereas i have totally. a lot of people who are fairly loyal in that respect and they like to help others Funny, through the process i was just going to ask that because there's some groups that i see where it's you go to those groups and I, i've noticed people just get more fearful yeah. especially with SIBO for some reason it just seems yeah. that more harm is done than good although i know it's with good intention but nevertheless that's been my observation for sure, for sure. And and uh, it's impossible for me to moderate that. And what you'll notice with these groups as well, and I often have to tell people this, is I have a similar similar type of thing. People will come and they'll, they'll read about reactions to the different supplements and types, and they get really scared to try it. What I have to explain to people is that 99% of the people who use thiamine in, in any significant dose or use derivatives do not join Facebook groups. Right? You, you don't know who they are. If they don't have a problem or they just see benefits, then they, they're not going to be like complaining about it on a group. The, the, the population of the group is highly biased towards, or it's highly skewed towards people with negative reactions. So you have to factor that in. That's the only kind of uh, impetus for people to join a group in the first place is when they're coming across some kind of an issue and they want to deal with it. However, you know, I'm very fortunate in that there's lots of members there who can kind of guide through pe people without giving direct health advice because we can't legally do that. But it's really just an educational platform where we can say, look, I can answer questions in a non-direct way and kind of say, look, if I was in that situation, I would do this. I would add this and I would consider this. Please speak to your doctor about this. And so it's a way that people can network about it. Um, and and really that's, that's the main places that people can find me. I, um, I, I also run a, I, I started a supplement company called Objective Nutrients. This was in 2019. And this is basically um, a, a way for me to, um, it, it's really based on these kind of protocols. So, so thiamine based protocols, but in a, instead of recommending like six different supplements to people, it, it's, it's, we've got products that I have used over the past years and found to be beneficial in, in, doses that I've found helpful. Um, but instead of asking people to buy like six or seven different supplements is to say, okay, well, actually we have them here in this place. And so, uh, that, that was the purpose for, for making that company. And that's, um, that's, that's, I think that's basically everything. Yeah. Okay. What about just shifting gears a little bit, anything with your personal health of late that's been interesting or, or at all that you want to share? I know you had said some peptides that you've been experimenting with, but any lessons that you've personally found to be pretty helpful? Any lessons that I've personally found to be pretty helpful? Okay, so I can tell you what not to do, or what I found what not to do. I was I was previously, um, for the longest time, I was very strict with my circadian rhythm. These past four months, let's say, I've been under quite a lot of stress and have had numerous deadlines. Um, I've been uh, doing lots of things on my business. I've been writing articles, etc., And, uh, and I've gotten into the habit of staying up very late and, uh, yeah, much, much later than, than I usually would. What I can say is that that is definitely not a good idea. Um, I would, it, it's, it's really highlighted to me the importance of maintaining a good, a good circadian rhythm. And the way that I can, I can tell objectively is I use the aura ring and looking at my sleep scores and the effect it has on my autonomic nervous system. We talk about, all about thiamine as me telling people to take thiamine for the autonomic nervous system. and me actually staying up really late. The, if you don't have something like an aura ring or some kind of a tracker, which can give you this, this, this feedback, what I can say is that even staying up, you know, a Anything past midnight, a couple of hours past midnight, you would be amazed 
at the effect that this has on your recovery, your nervous system, your stress levels, um, and your heart rate and your heart rate variability. So what I can say is, is um, I've learned over the past couple of months that one of the most important things that you could possibly do if you want to maintain a good level, a, a good, good autonomic nervous system balance and, and good stress resilience is maintain a solid circadian rhythm, not staying up into the early hours of the morning and, um, and waking up with sunrise if, if, if possible. And that's, that's, that's something that I've, I've, I've experienced directly over the past couple of months. And it has had the strongest effect of anything I've ever done. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the only thing I can that, that, say that, comes no, that, to that, that makes, that makes sense. And I'm hoping to, to tie that in. If people are trying to go to sleep, but they can't, this is one new tool, Thiamin, that may actually help with what can be so challenging, which is either onset or maintenance insomnia. So for the person who's in bed at 11, but they, er, they can't fall asleep until one o'clock in the morning. Um, hopefully this can help them. Cause you know, I, I hear from a lot of people who say, doc, I'm doing everything. I'm meditating before bed, not having caffeine after noon, not eating too close to my bedtime and I still can't sleep. So for those of you out there, don't stress out. There's hope that if you're having trouble with sleep, hopefully thyme and among some of these other tools can help you and fully agree with you, Elliot, that you just can't get around sleep. I've tried, I think we've both tried. <laughs> we've tried with all sorts of techniques, but uh, you are making a deal with the devil, so to speak, in that it's, it just slowly kind of grinds you down. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just cool. one, well, sorry, yeah. one quick yeah, thing please. on that. You said a uh, thiamine in sleep. Um, what we didn't talk about was when to take thiamine. Most people find take it in the morning. However, you just touched on something which I think is actually really important is that one thing I have found is that for people who have insomnia, what they actually find is that if they take thiamine before bed, in some cases, that is the thing that can address it. And what we think is happening is that it's help, helping actually stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and reduce sympathetic. So although most people will say take it in the morning because B vitamins can stop you from sleeping, some people do find that taking it at nighttime can actually help. Sorry, I just wanted to quickly add that in there. No, that no, was I'm, a clinical I'm so glad pill you did. I ne I, I never even conceptualized, but a bunch of people on my group actually said that they started doing it. And so I started using it in that respect and it really helped mm. some people. So, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that because you're right. It is very counterintuitive. We think B vitamins, stimulation, energy, avoid before bed. Uh, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you added that in. Great convo, Elliot. Appreciate you and all your work. And thanks for chatting today. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for having me on, man. It's really a pleasure. <laughs>